So let me briefly introduce Dr. Karma Punso, um, although many of you are already familiar with him. Um, he did uh, his um, Lopen degree, yes, um, in Mysore, and then went to Oxford for a doctorate um, in Oriental Studies. Um, and he's worked at a number of world-renowned universities, so Harvard, Cambridge, um, and he's currently working in Bhutan now on a project um, uh, regarding uh, oral preservation, preservation of oral history and oral culture. Um, and, and on top of writing a book on the history of Bhutan and on Buddhist philosophy, has been quite involved, um, uh, quite an engaged scholar as well, and has worked, of course, with Loden, as many of you are aware, um, to provide loans for Bhutanese, young Bhutanese entrepreneurs. Um, so thank you all for coming. And um, without further ado, I think we'll jump straight into a discussion of Dr. Karma's book. Um, <clears throat> so doctor, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about deciding to pursue your degree at Oxford, because you had already pursued um, Buddhist studies um, before then, and I was wondering if you could talk about what motivated you to decide to go to um, Oxford, pursue a degree in Oriental Studies, and how it was um, you came on this topic of emptiness. Uh, thank you, Jason. Um, first, I want to thank you for organizing this, coming up with the idea to have this, and uh, also in advance for the review that you write. And uh, to Ati Foundation, to Riyang Books, who brought out the second edition of the book. The first edition was so ex expensive that even uh, Europeans couldn't afford it. So we are really pleased that Riyang could reproduce this book for a very affordable price. Um, and before I get into the proper answer, I think because I believe in the Bhutanese tradition, the value of traditional education, you do a token practice of the traditional education system. And that I would like to do, actually by reading the, um, the dedication on the book, but then most of you don't have a copy, so uh, I think instead I will do a prayer to Manjushri, because it's after all Manjushri's blessing that we have any intelligence if you do. <laughs> So, <laughs> Activity. And there will always be a reminder 
to all involved to cultivate the best of intentions. And that is to think that I'm doing this work, getting into such an activity, with the aim of taking all the sentient beings to supreme enlightenment through the knowledge we gather, through the learning that I acquire in this session. So with that sort of ritual or basic Buddhist practice, now I'll come back to your question. Um, why I took interest to go to the West, to Oxford in particular, after getting a full monastic traditional education, was uh, due to the social changes going on in Bhutan. When I was a monk, so that is in the late 80s, 1980s, and early 1990s, Western education took off so uh, fast and widely across Bhutan. University graduates were coming into the public stage, and they had all the, the authority, the privilege, the, uh, the fashion, Everyone looked up to them, and they also wielded their Western knowledge, the education they acquired through Western knowledge, with a great deal of arrogance and superciliousness. So when they would see a monk, for instance, however well-educated that monk is, a lot of the old monks are very well-educated, highly refined personalities, because they meditate on their personality half of the time. But just because they didn't speak English, or they didn't have a Western degree, there was a strong bias that they were uneducated, that they were ignorant. So English was more or less equal to education at that time. And everyone aspired to get a university degree. And to, even we do that today. Huh? Even our election regulations are in favor of a Western education and not the traditional form of education and upbringing. So I, as a monk, who have already gone to high school and who had basic English, could sense that very easily. I would go to an office, and there would be this flashy young graduate office, officer who would look down on you as a totally ignorant, stupid monk. And of course, I would challenge them in English. And I felt that such prejudice is so unhealthy for our own culture and our own tradition, and that the only way to deal with such prejudice is to go and get a better degree or at least in equal degree as the one they had. So with my Buddhist education, I decided I'll go and get a very good Western university degree. And Oxford wouldn't be uh, a bad choice, especially to return to Bhutan and talk to the modern graduates and talk some sense into them that there is a great deal in our own educational traditions, in our own cultural heritage. So I went to Oxford because of that, and it was a long journey. It's a really long story, but to cut it short, I had to do a lot of preparation to pass my IELTS exams on my own. I didn't have even money to pay the fees, then to find scholarship to go. It was a really an ordeal. And when I finally made it to Oxford, of course, everyone then suddenly knew me. <laughs> so a few, weeks, a few months after I reached Oxford, everyone started to talk about this uh, monk who has gone to Oxford to do his PhD, <laughs> especially among the, the, the elites, the up higher circles of uh, temple. So you can see how much they adored the Western model of education. But one good thing that happened around that time was His Holiness the Dalai Lama has become more and more popular in the West, and especially in places like the Hollywood, he started to attract quite a lot of following. So we have people like Richard Gere going after him. In fact, he even came to Bhutan and he gave a public talk on Buddhism. Uh, we have so many learned monks who had never listened to, <laughs> who were totally neglected. But then Richard Gere comes in and he is suddenly worshipped to be the speaker on Buddhism. And the same applied also to quite a few Western academics. I mean, Bob Thurman, who uh, some of us here know, he came to Bhutan and he still comes to Bhutan and gives talks. Not that they don't know anything about them, they really know a lot. But then the Bhutanese appreciation of our own scholars and our own traditional experts was so low, and their adoration of Western people was so high, 
that when people like Richard Gere and people like uh, Bob Thurman came to Bhutan and started to talk of Buddhism, suddenly there was an awakening among our youth thinking, oh, there must be something interesting in our religion. <laughs> Why would these famous people go after the Dalai Lama if there's nothing useful in Buddhism or the Buddhist religion? So by the time I finished at Oxford, most of the modern educated graduates in Bhutan have reconverted to Buddhism, <laughs> so to say. And uh, they still do. I mean, you, you have people like Sergei Rinpoche come and talk. The hall is packed. But how many people make the journey upstream to listen to the ex Chikempo? Very few. No, it's not part all their fault. We also need to also have the monastics improve their way of communication, you know, especially with the youth in a modern contemporary idiom. So uh, I shouldn't put the blame squarely on modern educated youth and the graduates. But to a large extent, it was because of the educational bias that uh, the traditional people were looked down. And then Buddhism came back to Thimpo, especially to the English-speaking audience <coughs> via Hollywood and the West. And it still does so. And that was my main reason to go to Oxford. But the mission was accomplished even before I had to begin. <laughs> uh, well, that's quite interesting. Um, I was wondering, actually, if you could reflect on um, what were some of the differences between the Western style um, education that you participated in in your doctorate degree and your training in Buddhist philosophy um, in, in Mysore? So what, what were some of the things that struck you about that difference and um, if maybe you could reflect on um, in a little more detail what you've already mentioned about some of the differences between Western um, or the sort of secular education and maybe you know, Bhutanese Buddhist education. Um, I consider this very important, so I'm really grateful to you for bringing this up. Besides the motivation that uh, was related to social changes in Bhutan for me to go to Oxford, one of the reasons for me personally was to also understand how an academic, how a Western scientific academic secular academic understands religion and how the two ways of looking at one is differs or converges. And uh, I was actually quite surprised uh, that the Buddhist system as a whole is quite consonant, quite similar to the modern academic uh, methodology. There are big differences, though. For instance, uh, the kind of prayer I did, we did at the beginning of the session, wouldn't happen in a university lecture. In fact, you see, this is a sort of a mixture of the modern and the traditional practices. We are sitting there in a very modern way, right, having a, a dialectical, dialogical approach. Right. But in a traditional system, you have the teacher sitting on the throne. Then you have the students around him, almost in a sort of semicircle, like a mandala formation. And you have the prayers to start with. You have this uh, uh, reminder of cultivating the best of intentions before you start the teachings. And there's a whole regime of the intention, attitude, and behavior you have to adopt within the classroom setting. And they all come as part of the education uh, training. It's not a ritual or a, a forced regime, but it's all part of the educational process. Whereas in the West, you take the education totally out of this uh, regime. I was shocked when I first went to Oxford and sat in my Sanskrit classes, and one American friend would come with his cup of coffee and stretch his legs on the table as the lecturer started teaching. <laughs> and that was, to me, <laughs> such a big culture shock. How could you first have your cup of coffee in your classroom when the lecturer is busy teaching and then lift your leg up on the table and stretch it across? And that was bad even by Western standards. <laughs> but that sort of thing wouldn't be tolerated in a traditional setting. It's, it's not disrespect only to the teacher, but terrible disrespect to the learning, to the knowledge, to the whole system of education. So, uh, there are big differences as well in terms of the underlying ethos that informs the educational practices, in terms of techniques of education. So, in fact, I should at this point perhaps refer you to my one of my earliest 
published articles. It's called The Two Ways of Learning. It compares modern Western education, secular education and traditional Buddhist monastic education, uh, especially in Bhutan. And I've laid out the differences in the ideology, in the practices, in the behaviors, and so forth, and the curriculum. So, uh, but the critical part that I found very interesting for me is the critical approach. You know, how in modern academics you have a strong emphasis on critical thinking. You have to question things, you have to think critically. And that's exactly what the Buddhist masters also say, to a large extent that the Buddha's words should not be accepted as they are. You should test them like a saying gold by burning, cutting and polishing. It's a very well-known phrase, a well-known verse that goes on around the Tibetan monastic center. So although it's within a limit, you cannot go beyond the accepted religious system. You have a lot of room for critical thinking within that system. And that's exactly what I also found in the modern academic setting. But then one major difference I found later on between these two modes of critical thinking, especially if I compare social anthropology with Buddhist philosophy. Social anthropology analyzes things, uses critical mode of thinking to, for instance, construct a, a whole set of theories regarding this table, for instance. How do you look at the table? as a commercial commodity or a religious uh, tool or an educational uh, instrument. There's so many ways of looking at the table and social anthropology brings in a lot of conceptual constructs and superimposes those constructs onto the object. But Buddhist critical thinking is actually totally opposite. A Buddhist critical thinking asks, what is this table? Is this, this plank on the top or the legs on the four sides? Where is this table? And it ultimately aims to get rid of our conceptual construct of the table itself. So one sort of gives rise to this, <laughs> this amazing confusion of thoughts, and the other tries to reduce all that thought and take you to this meditative state of emptiness. So both approaching in a very reductive, critical, analytical way, but going towards totally different directions. Great. Well, it, it should be mentioned that for those of you who do pick up this book, it's actually a very lovely um, synthesis of a Buddhist approach and a Western philosophical approach. Um, and in fact, um, uh, Dr. Karma uses a lot of um, classical Tibetan and Sanskrit as well as um, Western philosophical terminology to explain his point. And so there's a really interesting, as you, I think as those of you who read it will notice, an interesting combination of the two approaches involved. But this is also a nice segue, I think, or transition um, into talking a little bit about what was it about emptiness um, that interested you? How did this um, become a topic for a dissertation? And then I think eventually we'll move into discussing what, what exactly is emptiness. So let's start with how you got interested. Um. I wouldn't say that I was personally specifically interested in emptiness as such. Emptiness is a topic that is so central that you couldn't uh, do without it if you were going through a Buddhist education. Uh, a lot of you would have known that the main pillar of the Buddhist practice and study is Chirapto Nambarjibi Sherap, Dharma Vibhanga Prajnya. It's the um, faculty, the uh, intellectual caliber to discriminate right and wrong, truth and falsity. So that forms the pillar, the central part of Buddhist practice. Without that, you cannot become a Buddhist, you cannot reach enlightenment. So you have the Chirap number Shirap, that discriminating wisdom, which forms the, the central part of the Buddhist study and practice. And that more as deals with how we understand reality, how we understand the nature of things. You know? So my wisdom or knowledge of discerning the truth of, him, of the table is so important in my relationship with the table. So the faculty to, the knowledge to understand the way things are is so fundamental 
on the path to enlightenment. Because if you don't see things as they are, there's no way you would become enlightened, even if you're totally convinced that some say charcoal is white. Uh, charcoal is not white, so therefore it's a delusion, even if you're totally convinced that it's white. So if you have to really be in consonance with, in agreement with the way things are. And the philosopher emptiness is basically about the reality, about the way things are. And for a Buddhist student, you cannot do any Buddhist study without it. In fact, so emptiness links also to you know, the concept of the six perfections. Emptiness links to the perfection of wisdom, the sixth one, the most important perfection. And uh, there are so many um, citations I will give you where it's claimed that without the perfection of wisdom, there is no liberation of any sort. Whatever Buddhist path you follow, you must adopt, you must engage in the perfection of wisdom. So uh, it's mainly because of that centrality that I also got into it. So any Buddhist student would have to deal with emptiness adequately to uh, have the education properly. But I would say my interest was more into the debates of emptiness. Even as a young boy, I think I was quite argumentative, you could say, I was stubborn and then argumentative. When I was a monk, a 17 year old, going to Cherry Monastery upstream, there was a, a fantastic uh, monk who has just come back from India and he was teaching. And uh, because he came back from India, I sort of assumed that he would probably know a lot about debates. So I asked him if he could teach us debates. But most of my colleagues, they found it so, uh, so ambitious of me to ask the teacher to teach debate at such a young age or at such a level of education. So they nicknamed me the debater. And I felt so sort of disappointed with the whole <laughs> system there. And it again is a long story, I ran away. I was, I'm basically a runaway call. I ran away, went to India, where I could find debates. Mm -hmm. So I went straight to Sera Monastery, one of the three uh, seats of the Gelupa tradition, thanks also. Mm -hmm. And Sera J is one of the best colleges in the world in the art of debate. So that's where I uh, picked up uh, the techniques of debate whole enthusiasm and zest for dialectics comes from that angle. And uh, when I went to the UK to uh, write a thesis, I thought uh, it would be very interesting to actually look at these debates because debates as they are are already interesting. So when you can do a bit more research to bring them to life. I always thought of my work as a uh, it's like a football commentator. So you have this um, Mipham and Narappa team and the Gelupa team who are playing against each other. And you can sometimes see one is outdoing the other. You know? Sometimes you have David Beckham in the Narappa group. Other times you have uh, another really great player in the, in the Gelupa group. And my job, I said, honestly, is to be a commentator. I will both narrate the game and also analyze it as far as I can. So I really found it fascinating from that perspective to look at all these great minds debating on emptiness. Great, yeah, so actually that, that also is a nice transition into some of the content of the book where you actually deal with um, the, the debate itself. So could you say a little bit about um, what, what exactly makes Mipam's definition of emptiness different from, say, the Gelupa or Narapa um, definition? Um, Nipam was on the Narapa side. On the so Narapa, so side Narapa side. and the Gelupas more or less were uh, opposing each other. Um, Nipam didn't bring an extra or a new definition to emptiness. So that's something that we should understand. No Buddhist master would claim to bring a new definition of emptiness. They will only claim to highlight and elaborate, reinterpret, or give more clarity to existing understanding of emptiness. So the, the, the Buddhists will never claim that they are bringing a new interpretation or new, sorry, uh, understanding. They'll always say the Buddha already had it all. 
all we have to do is simplify it or elaborate it or make it clearer, make it more suitable to a specific audience. So that was what exactly MIPOM was doing. MIPOM was, um, to use this uh, Greek uh, term, sui generis. He was a, sp a special person, a rare, a phenomenal person. You don't see such, brands, uh, such great minds very often. He, he had a very simple life, actually, and didn't even have a great deal of formal education. But he was a prodigy, a child prodigy, who learned things so fast. He would read a volume, and the volume would more or less go into his head. And uh, he spent half of his time meditating, the other half writing. And that's why we have now uh, 32 volumes, which actually, if we convert into sizes of uh, books, the size of Encyclopedia Britannica, we might have about 32 of such volumes. So not small books like these, I mean, really thick, fat books, very detailed ones. And um, what he felt at his time, um, again, he was reacting to the social circumstances, more religious circumstances. Um, in his day, that's late 19th century, Tibet was uh, being ruled by the Gelupa monks. So the 13th, uh, first, sorry, the, yeah, the 13th Dalai Lama, to an extent, and then lots of powerful people around him. And the Gelupa system was the state system, so therefore they could dominate <coughs> other religious traditions in various ways. And I think there was a great deal of Gelupa hegemony or Gelupa dominion uh, spreading into, uh, into areas where other religious traditions were strong before that. And one area where the Gelupa dominion started to spread was Kham, where Mipam was born. Mipam is from um, the Kham region, particularly around the area called Zachuka. And uh, with this, of course, the tradition, the whole understanding of emptiness and other religious principles and concepts and values were also spreading. Mipam didn't particularly like the Gelupa uh, theories or uh, systems of explaining emptiness. Uh, one, they were very verbose, too many words written in what, if you know anything about Gelupa monastic education, there are these books called Hikchas. They are sort of detailed manuals of your philosophical stance. And so detailed, too many words, but in essence, you know, the meaning you get out of that would be very little. I mean, you can probably um, summarize a thick volume in few pages because there's a lot of words used, especially as a sort of learning technique for young monks. So he didn't like that. Then he also knew that the Gelupas sort of brought down the very profound understanding of emptiness to a level where people can easily understand, but not easily understand the, in the right way. <laughs> sort of um, simplify emptiness, but at the risk of losing accuracy. So he was really worried about that. Then, at the same time, the Nyingmakas in his days were not strong philosophically. They didn't have a good philosophical work. I mean, think of people like Long Chenpa, of course. Again, he was another exceptional, was probably, uh, if he wrote in English, he would have outdone Shakespeare in, in terms of popularity and prominence, perhaps. But, he was exceptional in writing about Dzogchen and many other things. But he didn't write books that could be used as a philosophical textbook. The Gelupas had so many of such textbooks. And as a result, the Nyingmapas, the Sakyapas, and the Kajupas are relying on the Gelupas, or sometimes being dominated by them. And Mipam felt that very badly. So he decided that Nyingmapas must have their own stance, have their own detailed textbooks on emptiness or other topics. And that's the, why he started to write this. And to put the differences in a very simple way, now, we have to, of course, understand the basic uh, philosophy of emptiness. When you say, for instance, say this book, the book is empty. Right. Um, in the earliest discussion of emptiness, you have arguments, a very reductive mode of argument. And you reduce things into parts. The book is empty because there's no book apart from the pages. You tear off one sheet after the other, there's no book. There's no page because you can, again, 
tear off or cut off one paragraph after the other and there's no page left. You can again break down the paragraph into sentences, sentences into words, words into little parts of, uh, sorry, into uh, letters and letters to smaller parts and on and on and on and to the atoms and even further down and you don't find even the atoms. It's really like modern uh, sort of quantum physics. You don't find anything. And that's what it means to say the book is empty, there's no real book. Now, the Gilupas gave a new twist, Tsongkhapa gave a new twist to that interpretation. He said, no, you can't say the book doesn't exist. Because in, the, in classical text, you literally have this phrase, no, the book doesn't exist, there's no book. You know the Heart Sutra. There's, there's nothing. There's no I, no ear, no form, and so forth. And the Gelupas couldn't take that uh, mix, sort of. They thought that to take it literally, it confuses people. And it confuses uh, mainly in making people become unethical. For instance, if you think there's no Jason, if I truly believe there's no Jason, I pick up a pistol and shoot you. Right? right. Why should I? There's no Jason, really. <laughs> so they say there is a Jason. There is a real Jason, but there's no absolute inherent Jason. <laughs> there's a Jason that's conventionally there, but there's no true hypostatically existent. That's the term I so, use. So this is the concern um, that the philosophy of emptiness would create. Mm. Uh, what in the West we call nihilism, which is yes. nothing matters, exactly. there's no ethics, there's no sort of um, uh, rules guiding how you behave, everything just sort of happens for no reason and there's no nothing matters. Right? Yeah, exactly. So the Gilupas are accusing other scholars, their opponents, of nihilism. And uh, they gave a new interpretation, saying there's a famous uh, phrase actually, by Tsong Kappa, mm -hmm. and some of you might know. The vase is not empty of the vase itself. The vase is empty of an inherent existence. So the book is not empty of the book itself. The book exists, the book is a book, but the book is not permanent and absolute. Now that's what they were saying, basically. And they made the distinction because they thought if people thought there is no book, no real book, they would, then they wouldn't care about the book. Then you can extend that to say, if there's no real Buddha, they won't respect the Buddha. If there's no real Rejunde karma, then they won't care about Rejunde and karma. So their worry was the Narapas gave an interpretation which leads to nihilism and unethical practices. Mimam said, no, that's uh, not how it should be understood. He said, on an ultimate level, when you are in the mode of making an inquiry into the existence of the book, you truly don't find the book. The book doesn't exist. But when you don't do anything, when you relax, you know, when you are having the conventional transaction saying, did you buy the book, or I bought the book, this book is really thick, and so forth, then you assume there is a book. That's the conventional mode of transaction. And on that level, there is a book, but the book is an illusion. That's what he said. So if you, his main criticism of the group is that, if you think there is a book, but there is no inherent absolute book, so this then would, you're making a distinction, right? Right. So this would be the argument that there is a book, it just comes about um, as a result of all of these pages happen to be arranged in the right order and somebody made it, um, uh, and it's because of all those conditions that there, the book comes to be. And for the, from the Galupa perspective then, um, so this would be the Dalai Lama school of Buddhism, um, there is a book, it's just, it depended on all these other things to sort of bring it into existence. And it sounds like what you're saying, Mipam is arguing, is that emptiness means something a little bit more than that. Yes, yes. Uh, um, there are two major issues that uh, I can point out. One is, if you believe there is a real book, but no permanent absolute book, but a real book, we are not attached to a permanent absolute book. We are only attached to this book that we can see. Right? So Mipam's criticism was that if you think Jason exists, if you really think Jason exists, you will be attached to Jason anyway, right? even if you don't believe in a permanent, absolute Jason. So the whole purpose of emptiness, acting on your attachment, on your grasping, 
sense of grasping is lost. So uh, both Nippa and his uh, um, and scholars on his side basically argued that the Gilukpas totally lost the, the purpose of the teachings of emptiness. Because if you can't see the book as empty and only see the book as empty of something else, what's I mean, what's the use? I, mean, I can see the book as being empty of a cup, but that doesn't reduce my attachment to the book. I have to see the book itself as empty in order to reduce my clinging and attachment to the book. So that's the one argument there, sociologically. So on the path to enlightenment, you really need to see everything as empty. You can't just see everything as lacking another thing. <laughs> one of the classic Tibetan analogies. You can see a cow without a yak's horn, but that doesn't do any benefit in understanding the cow. <laughs> so then the other issue is, um, the Gilupas just understood emptiness as so the book being empty of an absolute existence, inherent existence. So they couldn't say exist. They consider emptiness as something that you can understand, that you can intellectually grasp and also uh, fixate on, or so put your thought, mind on. Whereas Mipa argued that the book we think is, is, it exists, that's one problem we have. We think things exist and we attach to it, we cling to it. So first you get rid of that um, the sense of attachment. To do so, of course, you get rid of the existence of the book. So first, you, you analyze the book and come to the realization the book doesn't exist. The book is empty. And that will help you get rid of the attachment to the book. That's the first problem solved. But then you may think, oh, this is no book. <laughs> the emptiness of the book exists. <laughs> the book has, doesn't exist, but the non-book exists. No? So there is a possibility of actually being too attached to emptiness itself. So he says, no, you can't do that either. Emptiness is also empty. So you have to get rid of the attachment, the clinging, the fixation on the non-bookness, the emptiness of the book. So that's the second problem we have to get rid of. And then in old days, when this philosopher was expounded, some non schools would come up and say, oh, there, there's no book, there's no non-book, but there's both. <laughs> both book and non-book. And the Buddhists had to come with a counter argument saying, no, even the both doesn't exist. And right. then the neither doesn't exist. So you first get rid of the ex first extreme called existence, yubetha. So that is the most important for uh, ordinary people because most people are attached to things that exist or that are deemed, that are seen to exist, right? So yubetha, the extreme of existence, is the one to, for which a great deal of effort is put to get it off. And Nipam therefore says, the Gilupa approach is fantastic. It's not the ultimate, it's provisional, it's just the first step. <laughs> it's very good to understand that the book lacks inherent existence, but you must also know that the em emptiness of inherent existence also doesn't exist. So the book doesn't exist, non-book doesn't exist, book doesn't exist, neither does exist. And that way you reach a point where um, if in classical Tibetan is put it as uh, in Sanskrit it's nish prapancha, lack of any elaborations. You don't, you cannot see the book, you cannot see the non-book, you cannot see both, you cannot see neither. You, your thought cannot sort of pinpoint anything, rest on anything. Your thought basically ceases to function because you find, don't find anything to grasp on. And that is the true, the ultimate understanding of emptiness from the perspective of Nipam and his side. So quite complicated. Quite complicated, <laughs> mystical. Yeah. Well, the other thing that, and I think this is at the end, so um, that comes up in reading the book is you get a sense that one of Nipam's critiques is about um, the Galupa understanding, so it's an analytical. They, they haven't quite interpreted the proper Buddhist perspective on this. So this, right, he's not inventing, he's saying that the Gelugpas haven't quite got their interpretation, right? Um, and the other is that it, that leads to ethical problems, right? So then you don't, you don't get rid of this attachment. Um, and then the other thing that struck me as quite interesting reading this was that um, Mi Pam places a lot of emphasis on the fact 
that um, reason won't get you to a proper understanding of, of um, emptiness alone, but you have to have some sort of, you have to transcend these dualisms of being and not being, and which is why you have, of course, in the title of, the, of um, Dr. Carmen Punzo's book here, the to be or not to be or neither, is this idea that for me, Pom, it's about, it's not just either or, you're supposed to have some sort of direct experience or understanding, and there's a little bit of a different approach. Is that, does that roughly, Yes, it's uh, almost okay. uh, correct, but uh, there's a slight difference, uh, some nonsense there. <laughs> Nepal was not against the reasoning, he was not right. against rationalism. But to see uh, either or is a very mundane, profane rationalism. So from Nepal's perspective, uh, to think that it either should be existent or non-existent, that sort of rule applied to ordinary people who can't think beyond, but for those people who are enlightened, who have greater understanding, such limitations were not applicable. So he didn't <coughs> accept what in philosophy they call the law of non-contradiction or logical devalence, um, excluded middle. Those things he said applied to ordinary reasoning. So if, for instance, um, an example would be, um, the charcoal is white. If charcoal is white, is true, charcoal is black, cannot be true for an ordinary perception. But Mipham was saying the philosophy of emptiness transcends that sort of rationalism. So I actually called it sub-rationalism. <laughs> it's a, sort of a superior form of rationalism. It's not lack of rationalism. He said, actually, if you rationalize and criticize, analyze existence and non-existence, you can get a third sort of uh, transcendent alternative. No, you don't have to stick with just these two options. So uh, he followed rationalism, but his rationalism was higher than what he considered the profane, mundane rationalism. And why I point this out is because Mipa was a great rationalist. He believed in reasoning. And uh, he was one of the greatest Mingma scholars on Tsema. Tsema being the uh, uh, discipline in epistemology and logic. Uh, he wrote a great deal on Sema and he argued that to understand Uma, Madhyamika, or the philosophy of emptiness, you must understand epistemology and logics well. Without the seat of Sema, the, the, the base of Sema, you cannot have the Uma on it. Then he argued that, now another thing, bringing in the mystical element is, um, he even took his reasoning to the extent of applying it to Dzogchen. Dzogchen being the most, the highest, the most mystical system in his world, he wanted to rationalize Dzogchen, reason it out. So he actually very proudly said, especially to his Nyingma audience, in order to master the Kada idea of Dzogchen, you must fulfill, you must perfect the Prasangika understanding of emptiness, the, the middle way school understanding of emptiness. So he was a true rationalist and he wanted to rationalize the whole system, even those that were left as mystical. And he used a higher form of rationalism to sort of explain the mysticism in it. Now with regard to how uh, he dealt with direct experience and so forth, there's not a, a great deal of difference with other uh, masters. He always started the intellectual understanding. With emptiness, you first have to understand it intellectually with your head. You first really have to realize how the book doesn't exist, but is also not non-existent, neither and both so forth. And once the, you are fully convinced in your head, you know, when you have got the conviction in your head, you reflect on it more and more and more. And then, as the Tibetan master said, the conviction will slowly sink down from the head to your heart, and then it becomes an experience. And that's when you directly sort of experience it. And here in Bhutan, for most of you, you would know that we have a strong tradition of mind-pointing instructions, you know, of looking at the nature of one's mind. It's all about emptiness, but being put in a more skillful technique, using Mahamudra or Dzogchen methods, to deal it with less with the head and more directly with the heart. <laughs> And I think this is, you call it uh, transcendental rationalism, right? So he's sort of bringing mm -hmm. together. So mystical 
uh, a mysticism would be this attempt to have a direct experience mm -hmm. as opposed to um, reasoning and using logic and intellectualism, which in, in Mipam is sort of bringing these two strains together. So um, I'd like to ask one last question before we open it up for some um, questions from the audience in case anyone um, still isn't clear about emptiness or has some doubts. Um, and that's, uh, we've been talking about this book not existing, but on a very conventional level it does. And so what inspired you to um, publish in a, a second edition in Bhutan, um, yeah. <laughs> well, I've always felt so um, apologetic and grateful of not being able to address the Bhutanese audience as much as uh, I should, especially when I was working in the UK. I tried as much to come back to UK and engage in the UK. And uh, even now, I think that uh, if the non Zongka speakers were not here, I should have actually done this in Zongka you know, for the local populace because the language works much easier for it, for the topic. And as a Bhutanese, talking to the Bhutanese, that would be also a much more appropriate medium. Why have our own cultural heritage sort of passed and strained out through a foreign language? Because we lose quite a bit doing so. But then, uh, so because of that, when I published the first book edition, which I managed to publish very quickly after I finished <coughs> my exams, I was uh, really uh, privileged to have two examiners, both very well-known professors in Europe, uh, Franz Karl Erhardt and Professor Matthew Gepstein. They came and examined me and uh, gave a very positive review. And I printed that review out and sent it to the publishers. And they found that uh, uh, acceptable as a book review. <laughs> So the book went straight to publication as a result, and uh, Francoise, who is here among us, she gave me a postdoctoral uh, fellowship in Paris when I could uh, rewrite the thesis into a book that most people, most other people can read. And uh, when I had a deal with Rutledge, Rutledge is a well-known academic publisher in the West, they don't really care much about uh, wide readership. They just sell it to the libraries and academics who can't do without the book, uh, you know, those who have to work on emptiness. So they have such a high price, and I knew that. So I made a deal with them. That <coughs> I'll keep the rights for publishing in Bhutan. And they agreed to it, because they probably didn't even know where Bhutan is. <laughs> so uh, I could have brought out this uh, edition a long time ago, because the book came out 10 years ago, nearly 10 years. And only this year, thanks to Riyam, we managed to bring it out here in Bhutan for about 5% uh, of what Rutledge charges in the UK. So I'm really pleased that now some people can have access to it. Well, thank you so much for taking time to discuss the book with us um, and, uh, and um, explain emptiness in Mipam's philosophy. Um, I'd like to go ahead um, and first Thank you, and then open it up for questions. So, thank you, Dr. Thank you. Uh, yeah, don't be shy. I, I've already obviously made a few mistakes in interpreting uh, Vipam's philosophy, so don't be embarrassed. You said people wouldn't have understood emptiness, but. Uh uh, let's not even worry about understanding. Even if people start to ask about what emptiness is, even if they doubt what emptiness is, Arya Deva, first century Indian scholars, those who even remotely doubt the concept of emptiness will have the uh, samsaric, their worldly existence shattered to pieces. So you're bound to get enlightened as a result of questioning emptiness. Well, thank you very much. This is a mm -hmm. profound explanation of the emptiness. Um, I think it is extremely important to of this book on emptiness because uh, the, the notion of emptiness is not all that much known in other Buddhist traditions like in Japan or in China. And I think the Tibetan Buddhism is a good special. Uh, position of this teaching. And we all, uh, the impotence is just taught in Rajin Paramita literature, mostly. And it is a special talk of Buddha, 
taught in the Brazilian parliamentary literature, and this, uh, and in Tibet, though for Buddhist philosophers, they try to understand what exactly Tibetanism means. And there are hundreds of, shall we say, in different interpretations of this meaning, the meaning of Tibetanism. And I just wondered, it's not only philosophical, it's also there is a political dimension in this as well. And this, uh, for example, the, the school in Janampa, and then followed by the Gilpa. And this the interpretation given by Okshimiya or emptiness by the Janampa was completely rejected by the Gilpa. And this led to some kind of hostility between the two schools, finally leading to some kind of political question of the Janampa's position taken over by the Sun King and which was eventually overthrown by the Gilbert. So from that time, that's to say from 1642, the, the position of the Chonampa on this teaching became almost extinguished in Tibet, uh, central Tibet. But then later, like Mipam and other philosophers, taking up again, more, I thought Mipam was more leaning towards this interpretation of the Janampa position rather than Gilpa. Mm. Uh, but I must confess that I have not read your, I had no chance to read your thesis, which is also published quite a while ago. I must apologize for that. Uh, and I would like to know your reflection on the position of Mipam of this epitomacy, which we have two words, like the Rantong and the Shinto, the Tionong words, as the Gopi Shinto, which is completely rejected by the Yilpa, but by taking by a certain number of great teachers, like Tarana, Tarapukos, and then later Mipam, uh, taking up. But I would like to know your own reflection on this Mipam's position, exactly what he's taught. Great. Um, so I think that was a little bit quiet. Um, so I'm just going to, you know, if I mess anything up, let me know. But I'm going to try to summarize the question. Um, um, so what the gentleman was doing is he was, first of all, thanking Dr. Karma for um, bringing up a very important topic that often is not um, as prominently discussed, although it is a part of other schools of Buddhist philosophy. Um, and Buddhist practice. Um, he also has talked a little bit about the Heart Sutra, which you may be familiar with, the Prajnaparamita Sutra, um, which talks about emptiness. Um, and what he wound up, uh, the question he wound up coming to Dr. Karma with was about um, the political situation and the ways in which, um, in particular, different interpretations of emptiness were connected to different schools of Buddhist philosophy, and how, um, for the Gelupas, this uh, alternative interpretations were actually suppressed. And what um, uh, Dr. Karma's opinion was on uh, the political role of emptiness and how it became part of this, this competition or disagreement between Buddhist schools. Yeah. If you don't know, uh, again, uh, Professor Samtin Karmela, he's one of the senior most Tibetan figures to become uh, academic researcher in the West and uh, now retired, of course, he has um, so many books authored by him, mm. countless articles. He has been teaching for a good 30, 40 years or so in the West on both Buddhism and uh, Bon religion. Um, and uh, Genla brought up uh, very appropriately the political dimension to the understanding of emptiness. It's very important and I think um, we should know that because uh, it relates to sectarian problems. In Tibet, uh, emptiness was a big issue and therefore uh, a lot of people took sides along the lines of interpretation of emptiness and that led to sectarian violence and also to sometimes the total closure of some Buddhist traditions 
Uh, so the, during the fifth Dalai Lama's time, the Shentongpa, uh, the Jonangpa tradition, which followed the Shentong understanding of emptiness, was uh, more or less eliminated. This is just uh, around the time Shabdrung was uh, forming the state of Bhutan. Now, at least here in Bhutan, we didn't have such major sectarian problems because both the Kaju and Nyingma understanding of emptiness are more or less on the same tune, and uh, um, one didn't have a dominating position to eliminate or get rid of the other. Um, but more precisely, Genla was asking about Mipam's position on Shentong and Rangtong. Now, there are two Buddhist, uh, Tibetan Buddhist philosophical understandings with regard to emptiness and Buddha nature, because they are sort of connected, intertwined. Uh, for instance, now, especially when we talk about the nature of our mind, the same more, the nature of the mind is explained as being both empty and also luminous. The luminous aspect is often explained as the inherent Buddha good in us, not that we are all Buddhas uh, primordially, especially the Dzogchen and the uh, Kaju traditions, the Enigma and Kaju traditions promote this idea of primordial Buddha within us, how we all need to just open it up and bring it out. And uh, the Gelupas diverged from the Enigma and Kaju understanding in a great way, and also some other Sakya understanding. Um, what the Shentongpas, uh, Shentongpas can include some Kajupas, some Mingapas, some uh, uh, most Jonangpas, and they argued that my nature of the mind has all the qualities of the Buddha. The Buddha is already here in me as it is. All I have to do is bring it up. But at the same time, empty, according to Mipha. But some Shentongpa philosophers would argue that the Buddhahood in me is real, everything else is empty. So to give you a good understanding of what Shentongpa means, you have the Buddha nature in you, which is real. It is empty of all the other impure things, the samsaric things, things that we have accumulated provisionally. So that's why it's called Shentong. The nature of the mind is empty of the other, other adventitious impure things, but not of itself. The Buddha nature or the nature of the mind is real. It's empty of only the other things. Whereas the Rangtongpas would say, even the nature of the Buddha, or the nature of one's mind, is empty of itself. It is illusory and um, transient. So, uh, that's the difference between Shentong and Rangtong philosophy. Now, there has been a great deal of uh, uh, doubts and arguments as to which school uh, Mipham belonged. Now, among the Shentongpas, we have famous people uh, like uh, the ones that Genna mentioned, Jonangpas, a lot of Jonangpas, including the founder of Dilpo Bashar Gilsen. And later on, uh, the very famous one was Taranatha, who was teacher to Tsang Desi Phinson Nangyal, who was Shabdrung's opponent. And then uh, further down, during Mipham's time, one of Mipham's teachers, Kongchul Yundinjasa, was a Shentongpa. Was Mipham a Shentongpa or was it big? Uh, there was a lot of discussion going on especially in the West. Some scholars said he, is, he was a Shentongpa. I think even Jean said that, and then uh, they on John Pettit and Shenbin Hukum, they took Mipham as a Shentongpa. Um, I was arguing against that, because in one of Mipham's writings, especially uh, in his Rapsil uh, Dalet, in his uh, answer, his uh, uh, response to Pali Rapsal, who refuted his position. Mm -hmm. Pali Rapsal and Mipam were contemporaries and they were in debate. Pali Rapsal was a Hinduka, Mipam was a Nima scholar, and they wrote uh, letters to each other, basically philosophical letters to each other, attacking each other. But they were very good friends as well. Mipam had three major opponents who wrote to him criticizing his philosophical position. Um, one was a Nyingma scholar <laughs> who was reading Gelukpa textbooks. <laughs> then one was a very hardcore Gelukpa, and he actually was uh, not at all a friendly debater. He, he would throw at Mipam really nasty words. And he, he didn't really was uh, make friends with Mipam. He couldn't carry out a friendly dialogue with Mipam. But Parir Rapsel, who was a great scholar at the time, 
carried out very friendly debates with Mipham. And in response to his uh, refutation, Mipham says, my own system is Rangtong. So uh, Mipham has himself claimed to be a Rangtongpa. And there's no uh, reason why we should therefore classify him as a Rangtongpa. Now the main misunderstanding comes because Mipham adopts a theory which is in between the traditional Shentong and Rangtong viewpoints. Mipham argues that we have the Buddhahood in us, everything that the Buddha possesses is already in the nature of our mind. But he doesn't argue that that Buddha nature is absolute and real. Like Jonangpas would do, like say Kongchul Yodinja so would do, the Shentongpas would say that the Deshik Nimpo, or the Buddha nature is real and all the others around it are illusory. Mipam actually says Buddha nature is empty of itself, it's as illusory as the table and the book and all of us, but nevertheless, the Buddha nature has all the qualities of the Buddha right now. So he actually takes part of the Zhentong philosophy in having all the Buddha qualities latent in us, but then also takes the Rangtong position by saying those qualities are illusory. <laughs> Even Buddhahood is illusory from his perspective. And actually, he has a very good uh, basis uh, for that in the Prajnaparamita Sutras. In one of the Shirchin Sutras, you have this verse. Even if there is something superior to enlightenment, you should see that it is illusory. So Buddhahood is illusory. That's his position. So he is a Ramtongpa, but he combines the, uh, an element of the Shentongpa position. Great, thank you so much. Um, other questions? This one's not ready. Please. Oh, okay. uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to deviate from emptiness. Uh, and I'm going back to education and critical mind. Uh, because you very promptly uh, explained that in Buddhism, nothing should be taken for granted and we should always have a discursive and critical mind. And it's a little different from the West, but it's still there. And what I found during my experience in Bhutan is very often in school or in colleges, the, there is absolutely no idea of critical. And being critical, even my students, if I say, please be critical, which is a basic of Buddhism also, critical reason. If I say something wrong, you should tell me. You should have arguments. This is not, or was not, practiced in Bhutan. And I wonder where this lack of critical mind in the traditional system comes from. Because in Buddhism, it doesn't, it's not there. So what is your feeling? Because I've been wondering for a long time, and I've no answer. Um, so I'm just going to repeat this just to make sure that anyone defined, and also so that it gets recorded. Um, um, uh, so Professor Pomeray um, mentioned that um, Dr. Karma was talking about how Buddhism has this very critical mindset um, that you shouldn't take things um, for granted, but should critically engage them. Um, but that she notices while she's been teaching and while she's um, um, experienced the Bhutanese education system that uh, this doesn't seem to be common in Bhutan. And in fact, um, from in many of the schools and, and for many of the students, there isn't much of an understanding of what it really means to be critical. And if Dr. Karma had any insights into why that was the case. I must say, I totally agree with you when it comes to formal education system here in Bhutan. I don't know how we managed to shut down people's uh, critical thinking in the mainstream school education and college education. But uh, debate being part of the education, dialectical thinking being part of the system, in mon monasteries you have a great deal of critical thinking. But having said that, I want to clarify though, there's a big difference between the Buddhist critical thinking and the sort of modern secular critical thinking. A fundamental difference, simple difference. 
Buddhist, we know all, we call our, all call ourselves Nangpa. Yeah. The critical thinking is not outward, it's not extrovert. Critical thinking is always introvert and focused inward. So the most important critical thinking has to be carried out towards oneself on how what one is doing. Now, what basic Buddhist training is, are you really thinking a good thought or a bad thought? Now, it's really criticizing and analyzing oneself rather than he, is he a good person or a bad person? That's none of your business. You really have to look inward. That's what the Buddhist focus on, what the Buddhist emphasize on. So the Buddhist teachings uh, talk about and promote a great deal of, deal of critical thinking that's focused inward. It can be easily focused outward, outward as well. The same technique can be used outward, but then you lose the main purpose of critical thinking. So the Buddhist form of critical thinking is really to criticize oneself first, not to make oneself depressed or despondent, but to really improve oneself. So <coughs> there's a great deal of that tendency in the Buddhist monasteries. Instead of criticizing somebody else out there and questioning someone's word out there, you would sort of turn back and look inward and criticize oneself. And that sometimes leads to being complacent with whatever happens around you. But uh, if you're a responsible Buddhist, I suppose you have to criticize yourself first and foremost, and then help mend things outside as well. Does that answer your question? I think it's mainly that Buddhist influence of criticizing oneself first, which leads to some shyness and some reluctance in challenging and questioning the other person. Yes, I agree and I disagree. Okay. Because you say that in Buddhism, even the speech of the master, you shouldn't accept. Mm -hmm. Go, you should look at it and look at every word and if needed, mm -hmm. criticize it. So, why, of course you have to criticize yourself mm -hmm. to get it somewhere, but why in the Buddhist traditional, I mean, formal system of education, why there is no criticism of the teacher? I think there are probably two reasons. Okay. If you are um, not really seriously taking the teacher uh, as your teacher, yeah. then uh, you'd rather uh, sort of yeah, uh, avoid doing anything negative, uh, committing any negative actions, or criticizing the person. And if you're if you're seriously taking that teacher as your teacher, then you have already accepted the teacher. You have to now work on your own perceptions. And it's not so much about whether you're going to be the judge for the best teacher in the world or in your country. It's more about what you can do, what, uh, what improvements you can make to yourself in relationship to that teacher. So I think there is a great deal of focus for inner change, inner transformation, even there. Um, but then the Buddhist system never encourages someone to take a teacher very easily or quickly. You have this uh, advice, Thongmar Lama Taklakheba. First, you must be very learned, very good at investigating, examining the teacher. Bardu Lama Tenlakheba. In the middle, once you have accepted the teacher, you must be very good in following or uh, uh, um, studying and learning from the teacher. In the end, you should be able to live up to the message, the teachings of the teacher. So, uh, traditionally, I was told that you should spend about three years or so analyzing and examining a teacher. So, I think you are given that opportunity to analyze and examine and criticize but maybe not express that criticism openly, because what benefit does that really do? If there's a real rogue, right? If there's a real charlatan, then maybe to help your friends or others, you can express your opinions. But otherwise, if someone is not appropriate for you, but doing great work for others, why unnecessarily impose your opinion on others? 
Now you, but you have to, of course, think of your own spiritual well-being and get the best for yourself. But uh, he says that I mentioned you are not mentioned here, and I really think he has played a big role in the Chinese uh, system, lack, what I call the lack of criticism, is uh, shutting down this potentiality, it's a linear system, mm -hmm. and especially the Indian system of examination, mm -hmm. where it is all about learning, mm -hmm. no criticism, no, uh, no reflection, and I would say that in Bhutan, this has been, uh, there has been very plus one, of course, but then this has been a very negative one, mm -hmm. that the Indian system has shut down this capacity of criticizing that the Bhutanese have. Yeah, that I totally agree with you. And it is not really something that can be fixed by telling the students to question their teacher. It's not how you cultivate this culture of critical thinking. You cannot instruct someone to be critical. But instead, it has to be embedded in the textbooks, in the teaching methodologies, in the pedagogy of how they think and analyze. So, for instance, um, if one were taught how to reduce this book into parts and parts into further parts, that sort of allows the mind, that the young mind, to analyze things and not take things for granted or on face value. And that sort of educational uh, technique and uh, methods slowly creep into the personality. It shapes the people's way of looking at things. And then they do a much more balanced, sober form of critical thinking. And if you suddenly just open the gate for criticism and say, you must now criticize your teachers and what they say, it will just lead to chaos with no discipline, no uh, of understanding, it, I think, will not be a healthy motion. So, instead of just seeing critical thinking as being shut down by a, a certain specific rule or regulation, or it being able to be brought out through a certain rule or regulation, I think it has to be embedded in the way people look at things, in the in their outlook, in their own attitude, and then we may have a very sound form of critical thinking, you know, where you have the equipment to analyze and criticize and discriminate and at the same time be able to respect the other. You know, when you promote critical thinking, often the pro problem is they lose the respect in what other people say. Other people have rights to their own opinion, so you have to respect that, but at the same time be able to engage in a critical way. So, so from a Buddhist perspective, there needs to be wisdom behind yes. the critical thinking as well. Okay. And that's why I find it so annoying when people, for instance, our uh, current election act says monks should be beyond discrimination. Because discrimination is a fundamental mm. uh, concept and practice in the Buddhist uh, tradition. You have to be able to discriminate the good from the bad, the right from the wrong. That's how you build up, how you improve yourself. If you don't know how to discriminate between what is good for you and what is bad for you, then you're lost, totally lost. So the whole monastic education helps you build that sense of discrimination. Not discrimination as in quarreling against each other, or mudslinging, or racial discrimination, or gender discrimination, but discrimination in a more sort of uh, constructive way. And that's what we should promote, <coughs> instead of saying they shouldn't be without, <coughs> they should be without discrimination and therefore left out of some major decision-making processes. All right, well, let's have at least, I think, one more question. Should be good. Perfect. First of all, thank you very much for uh, explaining a very sophisticated, profound topic on emptiness in a very understandable, clear way, Dr. Kama. I would like to go back to uh, Gyanla Karmi's question on Rampong and Jintong. Uh, in one of the readings that I <coughs> I did, uh, I uh, lead Jigen Durinch's writings on emptiness, he has mentioned that uh, as long as you have not accomplished uh, the, un the understanding of the union of Shentong and Rangdong, uh, you actually don't uh, understand the true meaning of emptiness. 
And I think there is also a saying by divine madman Lam Drup in there that in order to you know uh, strike the meaning of emptiness, you have to have the union of uh, understanding of the union of Xian Dong and Ram Dung. On that, uh, in that regard, I would like to uh, know if there are any insights that you would share. Uh, so just in case you couldn't hear in the back, um, um, uh, the, the question was about, uh, again, Rangtong and Shentongba, so these two different schools of thought on emptiness, um, and uh, whether Dr. Karma had any insights about um, sort of the synthesis of these two, right, the, the meeting point between the two, and, and um, um, uh, spoke about um, the fact that there are a number of examples from other Buddhist sponsors, so Drupa Kunle, for example, um, emphasizing the fact that there's a sort of a meeting point between the two. The two aren't completely separate. Well, uh, Lepen, I don't know if you know him, Lepen Slam Mumlen is a colleague from Nangrelin Shetra. He's a graduate of Naropa University mm -hmm. and now um, the Secretary General for um, Monastic Buddhist Sciences. Uh, but it really intrigues me. I don't quite know what the uh, Jehen would have thought in saying we have to reach the union of Rangtong and Shentong. If it is more in the context of Namo and Tongwa, not Nangtong Zunjuk or Seltong Zunjuk, I can understand. But I don't really know what you was thinking of when he said there has to be, and one has to reach the union of Rangtong and Shentong because Rangtong and Shentong from how we understand is a school of interpretation, a tradition of interpreting the Buddha nature. Um, perhaps because J.K. Dorichin was very, a, a very faithful reader of Mipam, uh, he really was a disciple or follower of Mipam because he read many things by Mipam and he expresses in his writings the ideas that Mipam promoted. Maybe he was thinking along the same lines as Mipam that when you look at your nature of the mind, it has to have the rangtong quality of being empty <laughs> of its own existence, but you have to also have the shentong quality of it being endowed with all the uh, virtues of the Buddha. So you have the the qualities of the Buddha endowed in your Buddha nature, which makes it a, a Shentong system. But then at the same time, that nature of the mind is empty of itself, which makes it a Nantong system. Would that be fair? Can you explain, David, how you understood Jaginan uh, and his Nantong Shentong Sunchuk? Did he use that term? What kind of term did he use? I, I think he was basically using the term Sunchuk. For Rangtong Shentong or Rangtong Shentong Zunjuk. Very interesting. I'm learning something new here about Rangtong and Shentong. Great. From our own great master, <laughs> Portuguese master, Jigen Po Yes. Yeah. Mm. Great. Well, um, I've certainly learned a lot and reading your book and having these discussions improved my own understanding. Um, so I'd like to thank you. And I'd also, um, I neglected to thank Auntie for being very kind in hosting us um, in their space this evening. So if we could please uh, give them a round of applause. They've been very kind. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank all of you. And um, if you have any questions, um, I believe Dr. Carmo will, will be here for a bit. And there are also um, books available um, for purchase if you are so inclined, as well as um, books about the genre which just came out. So um, please have a look. And let's also thank Dr. Karma one more time for spending his time with us. Thank you. We have to rely on Jason to come all the way around the world to make this happen. <laughs> Hardly. All right. Thank you all.